Um, we are just so honored and thrilled to have with us as our Constitution Day speaker, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. Dean Chemerinsky is really a con law rock star. He is a native of Chicago, and maybe he'll take a minute and tell you a little bit about that. He went to Northwestern before he went on to Harvard to earn his JD. He started his academic career actually right across the street at DePaul, but he's had a long teaching career at the University of Southern California, then at Duke. He then went and was the founding dean at UC Irvine, and he took that school from being essentially non-existent to really a top-tier school in less than 10 years. And this summer, he was hired to be the dean at UC Berkeley, and he's just in the process of move, moving there, just been there about two weeks. I think many of you in the audience use his constitutional law textbook. He did say he would entertain requests for autographs on said books. <laughs> Right, yeah. Um, he maintains a litigation docket, so he stays current. He just is one of the most amazing scholars we have in the United States. Um, please join me in welcoming Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction and the warm welcome. It's truly a great honor and pleasure for me to be here. Chicago is my hometown. I want to thank Darby for arranging such amazing weather while I'm here. If the weather was always like this, I would have never moved from Chicago to Southern California. At the end of January of this year, conservative provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos was scheduled to speak on the UC Berkeley campus. The then Chancellor Nicholas Dirks realized that there might be disruptions, so he called on the other nine campuses of the University of California to lend additional security forces. Despite all of these precautions, 150 masked individuals, called themselves Antifa, came through the campus breaking windows and throwing Molotov cocktails. Over $100,000 of damage was done. Chancellor Dirks felt there was no way, even with his beefed up security force, that he could assure public safety, so he canceled the Annapolis speech. He was roundly criticized for interfering with freedom of expression. That the next day, none other than the President of the United States, Donald Trump, tweeted that if Berkeley wouldn't protect free speech, all their federal funds should be cut off. Last Thursday night, another conservative commentator, Ben Shapiro, was scheduled to speak at the University of California. The University of California decided to take elaborate precautions. They had him speak in the largest auditorium on campus, Zellerbach Hall. They closed a key part of the street in front of the campus, Bancroft. They built concrete barriers in terms of a perimeter. People would need to show ID to get into that area. They closed the classroom buildings starting several hours before the speech. In order to get into the auditorium, it would be necessary to have a ticket and show identification. Altogether, the campus spent $600,000 to be able to assure Ben Shapiro's ability to speak. Thankfully, he was able to deliver his address. There was no violence, no major disruption. Next week, a group called Patriots on Campus have invited several controversial speakers and have declared it Free Speech Week. Milo Yiannopoulos is scheduled to speak on four consecutive days on campus. Ann Coulter and Steve Bannon are coming as well. The campus estimates that in order to assure security, to protect public safety, it will cost several millions of dollars. Of course, all of this money is coming from the instructional and research program of the campus. It's dollars the campus can ill afford. But the now Chancellor Carol Christ has said that Berkeley has to show that it's committed to freedom of speech. This is the context which I talk to you today. It's all happening in real time, and it's all happening on the campus where I now work. It's quite different than what we used to see with regard to freedom of speech. We normally think of freedom of speech as students on campus speaking. After all, that's what the free speech movement was about at Berkeley in the mid-1960s, the rights of students to express themselves. This is about outside speakers coming onto campus. 
The disruptors are also from outside of campus. Groups like Antifa made clear that they're willing to use violence to stop speakers they disagree with. It's also an ironic situation that I think speakers like Milo Yiannopoulos or Ann Coulter most want to be kept from speaking because then they can portray themselves as victims, as martyrs for the First Amendment. So it's in this context that I want to talk with you about free speech on campus. I thought that I would offer you a number of observations about where we are today, what the law is, what the law should be, and then I'll save about 10 minutes for questions before you have to go to class. My first observation is I see waning support for free speech among students and faculty on campus. I can give you many anecdotes to support this and then opinion polls that confirm this. So the last two years, when I was still at the University of California, Irvine, I taught undergraduate seminars on free speech on campus. Two years ago, it was for freshmen. Last year, it was an upper-level political science honors seminar. I co-taught it with the chancellor at UCI, Howard Gilman. We would begin each topic by posing for our students a real-world problem in polling them. For the very first class, we told them of an instance that had occurred a year before, in March 2014, at the University of Oklahoma. You might have read of the incident. Maybe you even watched the video on YouTube. It involved a group of fraternity members going to a fraternity event. The only people on the bus were fraternity members, and they were all dressed in formal wear. Two members of the fraternity stood up and led the fraternity in a deeply offensive racist chant. Among other things, it praised lynching. Somebody on the bus took a video on a cell phone. The video soon went viral. When the then president of the University of Oklahoma, David Boren, saw the video, he immediately expelled those two students from school and suspended the fraternity from operating on campus. We asked our students, if the two expelled individuals had sued the university and President Bourne for violating their First Amendment rights, who should win? The students on the grounds of freedom of speech or the university? I think Chancellor Gilman and I were both surprised that 15 to nothing our students voted in favor of the University of Oklahoma. Not one student in our class was willing to take the free speech position. I have no doubt that had the two expelled students sued the University of Oklahoma for violating the First Amendment rights, they would have prevailed. In fact, later, the general counsel of the University of Oklahoma said that he and the president knew they would lose if sued, but they felt it was important to take a stand. The two expelled students didn't sue, but they most wanted for all of this to go away. Last October, there was an incident at the University of Oregon Law School. A longtime professor at the University of Oregon Law School held a Halloween party in her house. She invited some faculty, some alums, some students. She came to the Halloween party in her house in blackface, wearing a white medical coat. She said she was trying to make a political statement about the absence of minorities in the medical profession, and more generally, in the learned professions. By the next day, it was widely known what she had done. She was suspended from teaching at the University of Oregon Law School. 23 law professors signed a letter urging her to resign because she'd created a hostile environment for her students. The students of color could no longer be comfortable in her class. There was a poll done and released just last Thursday that indicated that 46% of people in California believe that white supremacist groups should not be able to speak on campuses. Another poll was done by the Pew Research Institute a couple of years ago, and it found that 40% of college students believe that those who are expressing racist messages should not be allowed to speak on college campuses. So all of this suggests to me there is waning support for free speech on campus. Once more, I've seen it on my own campus. A week ago Friday, Chancellor Christ held a faculty panel 
to discuss free speech on campus in light of the coming events. I would say, without doubt, that the overwhelming sentiment in the audience was that Chancellor Chris should prevent speakers like Ben Shapiro and Milo Yiannopoulos and Ann Coulter from coming on campus, even if it violates the law. In fact, a number of individuals, both a faculty member on the panel and students, were saying, you have to prevent such hateful speech on campus, even if what you're doing by canceling the events infringes the First Amendment. Finally, towards the end of that public session, I said, let's just be clear. These speakers have a First Amendment right to be on campus. If Chancellor Christ were to cancel their appearance, she would get sued. She would lose. The university would have to pay the attorney's fees. She might be personally liable for money damages because she's violating clearly established law. You'll make those who are excluded from speaking into martyrs and nothing will be gained. Not a single person in the audience applauded for what I was saying. <laughs> Last Tuesday, there was a meeting of the Council of Deans on campus at University of California, Berkeley, the deans of all of the various schools. Many repeatedly said they didn't understand why the campus couldn't exclude these hateful speakers. So this is why I do see a lessening of support for freedom of speech on campus. It's interesting to think about why. Some, especially conservatives, said this is a coddled generation that wants to be protected. I disagree with that explanation. I think that the students, the faculty who want to restrict speech, are doing so out of the most laudable motives. They want to create an inclusive learning environment for all students. After all, this is the first generation to grow up from a young age being taught that bullying is wrong. They've internalized the message. Also, this is a generation that's had relatively little experience with the suppression of speech. I realize that for many of my college, maybe even law students, they're much more likely to equate freedom of speech with the vitriol of sites like Yik Yak than with the civil rights protests of the 1960s. The civil rights protests, the anti-war protests of the 1960s and 70s was long ago for today's college students as World War I was for me. One of the points I tried to make at the forum a week ago Friday is that almost all of the advances in civil rights and civil liberties have come because of freedom of speech. Whether you think of the suffrage movement that gave rise to the 19th Amendment women's right to vote in 1920, or the end of segregation and Jim Crow laws in the South, and you tie it to lunch counter sit-ins and protests on campus, free speech is essential to protect the very groups our students most want to safeguard. This isn't realized, or perhaps it's forgotten. My second observation is the basic principle. All ideas and views can be expressed on a college campus, period. It doesn't matter what the idea or the view is. For the purposes of the First Amendment, there's no such thing as a false idea or false view. The United States Supreme Court repeatedly has said, as recently as June of 2017, that the government cannot punish speech on the grounds that it's offensive, even deeply offensive. And there have been recent Supreme Court cases reaffirming this. You might remember one from earlier this decade, a case called Snyder versus Phelps. It involves a small church out of Topeka, Kansas, the Westboro Baptist Church, that goes especially to funerals of those who died in military service and uses an occasion for expressing a vile anti-gay, anti-lesbian message. Matthew Snyder was a Marine who died in military service in Iraq. The members of the Westboro Baptist Church traveled to where his funeral was going to be in Maryland. They asked the police before the funeral where they could lawfully stand and protest. The officer pointed an area about 1,000 miles, 1,000 feet away from the funeral. And the group before the funeral chanted and sang. During the funeral, they were silent, but they held up signs. That night, Matthew's father, Albert, saw news footage, and he could read those signs. They were very offensive. He sued for intentional infliction of emotional distress and invasion of privacy. A jury in federal court ruled in his favor, 
gave a large damage judgment. The federal judge allowed a $10 million judgment to stand against the members of the Westboro Baptist Church. But the United States Supreme Court, eight to one, said that such a damage judgment violates the First Amendment. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the court, and again he emphasized, the government cannot punish speech. The government cannot allow liability for speech on the grounds that it's offensive, even if it's very offensive. Now, I've spoken of this in terms of the First Amendment. As all of you know, the First Amendment applies only to government, so only to public universities. If I'm asked what is the least understood principle of constitutional law, it's that the Constitution applies only to the government and government officers. In fact, last week, at the meeting of the Council of Deans, I would tell you that a majority of the deans at UC Berkeley didn't realize that as to a private university, the First Amendment doesn't apply. But of course, that doesn't mean that free speech principles are inapplicable in a private university. Private universities also deeply committed to academic freedom. Core of academic freedom is that all ideas and views can be expressed. That's how knowledge advances. Often private universities express this in their principles, in their faculty and student handbooks that have often regarded as contracts between the university and faculty and students. So I'm not going to draw a distinction between public and private universities in terms of the principles that should be followed, but obviously I recognize the First Amendment applies to the public universities. Principles of academic freedom that they're choosing to follow apply to private universities. My third observation is that obviously free speech is not absolute. We all know that. Long ago, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes reminded us there's no right to falsely shout fire in a crowded theater. Over time, the Supreme Court has created exceptions to the First Amendment. These are categories of speech that aren't constitutionally protected. Some of them are relevant to discussing free speech on campus. As an example, incitement of illegal activity is speech not protected by the First Amendment. The contemporary test with regard to incitement comes from Brandenburg versus Ohio. It says that speech can be punished as incitement if there's substantial likelihood of imminent illegality and if the speech is directed at causing imminent illegality. That's a test that's very protective of speech, makes it very difficult to find incitement. I think the Supreme Court intentionally chose such a speech protective approach because earlier formulations had allowed for the punishment of speech and was tame and ineffectual. I've often been asked, why can't speakers like Milo Yiannopoulos be deemed to be engaged in incitement? The answer is incitement is when the speaker encourages the audience to go do something illegal. If there is a mob on campus and it's angry and the speaker says to them, go now and break windows, throw Molotov cocktails, in certain circumstances that would be regarded as incitement. But that's not what Milo Yiannopoulos is doing. What Milo Yiannopoulos is doing is coming and being controversial. The violence is directed against him. That can't be thought of as incitement. If that's enough for incitement, then the reaction of any audience, if it's hostile enough, could be taken to justify suppression of the speaker. Then there would always be a heckler's veto with an audience being able to suppress and silence views they don't like. There's a second category of unprotected speech that's relevant to campuses, and that's the Supreme Court has said that, quote, true threats are speech not protected by the First Amendment. The court initially said this in a case called United States versus Watts. It follows a federal statute that makes it a crime to make threats against the President of the United States. The Supreme Court said a distinction has to be drawn between true threats and hyperbole. In Virginia versus Black, the Supreme Court said that a state can't ban all cross-burning but it can forbid it if there is a true threat. That's all the Supreme Court has said about this category, true threats. There's a split among the circuits now in terms of defining true threats. 
I think the best approach is to say that there's no First Amendment right to cause a person to reasonably fear imminently for his or her safety. Imagine a campus situation where an angry group surrounds a person, yelling things that cause that person to immediately fear for his or her safety. That would be a true threat, and true threats are not protected by the First Amendment. There's a third category of unprotected speech that relates to what goes on on campuses, and that's harassment. Speech that constitutes harassment is not protected by the First Amendment. Most of the law in this area is developed in the employment context, not the educational arena. To pick the simplest example, if an employer says to an employee, sleep with me or you're fired, it is no defense that all the employer did was utter words. Likewise, the law that speech can give rise to a hostile and intimidating environment, and that that's actionable under Title VII or other employment discrimination laws. I worry, though, in the context of speech on campus, the word harassment is often used colloquially and not precisely in terms of the law. Just because people are saying unpleasant things on campus isn't enough to make it harassment. The law of harassment in the workplace generally says it has to be pervasive, it has to be directed at a protected classification like race, sex, religion, sexual orientation. It has to materially interfere with the ability of the person to function in the workplace. I think the same criteria can be used in an educational institution. When speech amounts to harassment, it's unprotected. Let me give some concrete examples. There was an incident at the University of California, San Diego, a few years ago, where somebody put a noose over a tree. It's deeply offensive but it doesn't constitute harassment. In that way, it's speech protected by the First Amendment. By contrast, I believe, if somebody attacked a noose onto a door of somebody in a dormitory, say an African-American student, that would be regarded as harassment. There's another incident at UCLA where a student posted online and put it on YouTube a viral which can be only described as an anti-Asian rant. And there were calls for the student to be disciplined. Putting that on YouTube was her speech, right? To discipline her would violate the First Amendment. That wasn't harassment. On the other hand, if she repeatedly yelled African-American students in her dorm or on campus racist things, then that would be enough for harassment. There's line drawing to be done, but that's so in all areas of the First Amendment. Well, I've mentioned to you some categories of traditionally unprotected speech, like incitement, true threats, harassment. You'll notice what I didn't list as a category of unprotected speech, and that's hate speech. There are very important, prominent constitutional scholars who have said there should be an exception for hate speech under the First Amendment. These are individuals like Charles Lawrence, Richard Delgado, Mari Matsuda. And their premise is persuasive. Hate speech inflicts real injury on individuals. If free speech had no effect, we wouldn't protect it as a fundamental right. Speech can have positive effects or terribly negative ones. There's no doubt that hate speech on campus can not only make people uncomfortable, it can cause great psychological distress, it can be physical manifestations, it can make people feel unwelcome who have traditionally been excluded. And yet the law is absolutely clear that hate speech is speech safeguarded by the First Amendment. Supreme Court on a number of occasions has reaffirmed that. About 35 years ago, there was a case called RAV versus City of St. Paul. It involved a St. Paul ordinance that prohibited burning a cross or painting a swastika in a manner likely to anger, alarm, or cause resentment. Burning a cross, painting a swastika, are vile symbols of hate. Nonetheless, the United States Supreme Court unanimously declared the St. Paul Ordinance unconstitutional as infringing the First Amendment. I already alluded to the case Virginia versus Black from 2003, where Virginia essentially prohibited all cross burning. The Supreme Court, eight to one, declared the law unconstitutional, saying the government could prohibit cross burning 
only if it mounted to, as I said, a true threat. In the early 1990s, over 350 colleges and universities across the country adopted so-called hate speech codes. These were motivated by the best intentions. But every hate speech code to come to a court was declared unconstitutional. Without exception, every hate speech code that was ruled on by a judge was deemed to violate the First Amendment. Why? As I said, if you take opinion polls of college students, a significant number, even a plurality, believe that hate speech should be able to prohibit on campus. I would say that it was without question the majority sentiment in the room a week ago Friday at UC Berkeley. Well, in part, it's the inability to define what's hate speech with any precision. As you know, any regulation of speech cannot be vague. It cannot be unduly overbroad. It has to give the reasonable person notice about what's protected and what can be punished. Issue you a challenge. Try to sit down and write a hate speech code that's not unconstitutionally vague or overbroad. Each of the last two years when I taught the seminar on free speech on campus, we asked the students to try to draft a hate speech code that wasn't vague or overbroad. They failed as colleges and universities have failed. Take as an example the University of Michigan hate speech code. This one more prominent examples from the early 1990s. There were a series of tragic racist incidents on the University of Michigan campus. In response to this, the University of Michigan relied on its law professors and attorneys in the community, as well as others, to draft a hate speech code. Among other things, it prohibited stigmatizing or demeaning people on the basis of race or sex. One of the challengers to the Michigan Hate Speech Code was a sociobiology graduate student. He said that most of his research was about whether there are inherent differences between men and women. He said he feared that if he came to the conclusion that there are sex differences of this sort, he'd be seen as demeaning people on the basis of sex. The federal district court in Doe versus University of Michigan declared that hate speech code unconstitutional on vagueness and overbreath grounds. The same thing happened to many other hate speech codes around the country. There's also something that can be learned with regard to hate speech codes and hate speech laws in other countries. The United States is one of the few Western nations that doesn't prohibit hate speech. If you look at the continent, for example, almost every country there has a law that prohibits the expression of hate. If you read those laws, you again see the same problem with regard to vagueness and overbreath that I described. What's striking in terms of the experience on college campuses as well as in these other countries, so virtually every prosecution is brought against members of minority groups. The very people who these codes were meant to protect are those who are targeted for prosecution. I mentioned the University of Michigan hate speech code. What's stunning is that every action that was requested under it was directed at a student of color. 100% of the requests for enforcement were brought against minority students. When England adopted its hate speech law, the first prosecution brought under it was those who advocated for Zionism. The prosecutor said, under the United Nations resolution, Zionism was defined a form of racism, so those who were advocating for Israel were engaged in racist speech. But maybe most of all, the problem with hate speech codes and hate speech laws is they're really suppressing an idea. Now, it's an idea that we find offensive. It's an idea that we wish didn't exist in our society. But racism, sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism is an idea. And so hate speech codes and laws are inconsistent with the premise I started with. All ideas and views can be expressed on a campus, no matter how offensive. Justice John Marshall Harlan expressed this well in Cone versus California, where he said, to censor words is to censor ideas. He wrote, we can't indulge the facile assumption that we can cleanse the English language to please the most squeamish among us. My fourth observation is that campuses can have time, 
place in manner restrictions with regard to speech, so long as they are viewpoint neutral, so long as they serve an important purpose, and so long as they leave adequate alternative places for communication. As you know, there's no right to speak any time, any place, and in any manner. There's no right to have a major demonstration down the middle of the Dan Ryan Freeway at rush hour. The city could certainly say it will have a time, place, and manner restriction to direct that someplace else. Famous early Supreme Court case involved a city ordinance that prohibited trucks with sound amplification from operating in residential neighborhoods at nighttime. The Supreme Court said that's constitutional because it is a time, place, and manner of speech. It's viewpoint neutral. It applies to all sound trucks, whatever their ideology. It serves the important interest of tranquility in residential neighborhoods at nighttime. And it leaves open adequate alternative places for communication. Campuses, too, of course, can have time place in manner restrictions. No one has the right to come into my classroom and shout so I cannot teach. You might have freedom of speech, but you can't go into the chambers of the Chicago City Council, let alone the Supreme Court, and yell so those bodies can't do their business. There can be time, place, and manner restrictions. Now, related to what I've just said, it is important to emphasize that freedom of speech doesn't create a right to silence the speech of others. A prominent example of this that occurred when I was still there was at the University of California, Irvine, several years ago. The Israeli ambassador, Michael Oren, was coming to speak. As he began, a student got up and yelled so Oren couldn't be heard. That student was escorted out. Oren began again. And a second student stood up and yelled so Oren couldn't all together, 11 students, over a fairly prolonged period of time, yelled so Orrin wasn't able to deliver his address. Ultimately, all of those students were escorted out. Orrin was able to speak. And when those students were charged with disciplinary violations, even criminal violations, they said, we were just engaged in speech. And I wrote an op-ed in the LA Times the week all this occurred. said, freedom of speech doesn't create the right to disrupt the speech of others. Again, if that were enough, then there would always be the possibility of a heckler's veto. Now, to be sure, the students who objected in Bassadorin still had free speech rights. They could hand out leaflets outside of that auditorium. They could have a counter demonstration, so long as they didn't keep Orrin from being able to speak. They could hold educational events. But they didn't have the right to keep others from being able to speak. Campuses can also have time place in manner restrictions to serve other values. I think dormitories on campuses are a very special place. The Supreme Court has said the home is a special place in terms of repose. I think campuses can restrict speech in dormitories because it is the home for college students, graduate and professional students who are there. But the regulations even in dormitories have to be viewpoint neutral. To take a prominent example, a campus could prohibit all flags from being shown outside of dormitory windows. But a campus couldn't have a rule that said no Confederate flags can be shown outside of dormitory windows. No flags is viewpoint neutral. No Confederate flags, as much as I'd like to see no Confederate flags, is obviously not viewpoint neutral. Another value that can be served by time, place, and manner restrictions is safety on campus. One of the things that really hadn't gotten as much attention when it comes to free speech on campus until the last year is the issue of public safety. When I spoke with the chancellor and provost on my campus in August, in the anticipation of these free speech events, I said, what you should do as much as possible is have the speakers be in a classroom or an auditorium where you can control the perimeter, you can require tickets and identification. Once the speaker is out in the middle of campus, it's much harder to protect public safety. The question, and there's no answer from current case laws, 
how much does a college or university have to spend for public safety in order to safeguard free speech? At what point can the campus say, we just can't afford this, we can't protect free speech and have public safety, so we have to cancel the speaker? I believe that canceling a speaker, public safety concerns, should always be a last resort. It has to truly be viewpoint neutral. But there's times when it's necessary. The campus absolutely has to do what it can to protect the safety of all students and staff and faculty. Is $600,000 more than the campus needs to spend? What about the millions of dollars that UC Berkeley is planning to spend next week for safety? Chancellor Chris asked me the question of how much does the campus have to spend to comply with the First Amendment? And I said, honestly, there is no answer from the case law about this. I said, the best I could do as a lawyer is say, you have to spend a reasonable amount to protect <laughs> public safety. Because after all, reasonable is so often the test in the law. I don't think that was the answer she was hoping for. <laughs> and yet, I don't believe the law can really do better than that. I don't know how you can quantify this is how much you need to spend in dollars and cents. She's made the choice, I think, for public relations and political reasons, that she wants UC Berkeley to be known as a campus for free speech. So she's spending a very large amount of money for this. But I think this is so much the cutting edge question right now. And it's going to happen not just on the Berkeley or the University of Virginia campus, but in campus elsewhere. Fifth observation about free speech on campus, what about some of the contemporary issues? Things like safe spaces, trigger warnings, microaggressions, the internet. If you've been following the discussion over free speech, you've certainly seen these issues raised. Safe spaces is a phrase very much in vogue. But I think the question is, what do we mean by safe spaces? Of course, we want every campus to be one where students are physically safe. But safe spaces cannot mean that we're going to protect our students from offensive ideas being expressed. We want all students to feel welcome and protected. But it cannot be that we're going to protect students from the ideas that might upset them. My hope is that it's the very nature of college and universities that all of us, students and faculty, are sometimes exposed to viewpoints that are unsettling. Trigger warnings have been much discussed over the last few years. Trigger warnings are where the professor warns students before offensive material is going to be covered. I'll confess, I've been giving trigger warnings long before I heard the phrase. When I teach First Amendment law, I always teach a case called FCC versus Specifica, which is about the George Carlin monologue on the seven dirty words. And I play that monologue for my students. I actually think educationally it's important because hearing it gives you a quite different sense of what's said than the Supreme Court's characterization of Carlin's monologue. But I've always begun by telling the students this has repeated use of profanity and they're welcome to leave the classroom during the monologue. I've never had a student get up and leave during the monologue, but certainly give them the trigger warning. When we began our class by reading to our students the racist chant from the bus at the University of Oklahoma, we warned our students that it was racist and very offensive. I have no problem with trigger warnings in that sense. My concern is if a college or university makes trigger warnings mandatory and requires that professors give them. That was proposed at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and at Oberlin College in Ohio. I think that is an infringement of an academic freedom that all professors have in terms of deciding how they want to cover material, how to best educate their students. Microaggressions, another word that's much in vogue. Microaggressions are slights, verbally delivered, that often the speaker doesn't realize are an insult. And the question is raised, should students, should faculty be punished for speech that others regard as microaggressions? And my response is, I don't think such speech can be punished for the reasons I said. But it doesn't mean that campus should ignore their responsibility here. Campus should educate students and faculty is what others regard as microaggressions. 
There can be programs such as during orientation to teach about them, but that doesn't mean the speech should be punished. Some of the hardest questions with regard to free speech now arising concern the internet. It used to be that the issue of free speech on campus was whether a student could be punished for what he or she was saying while literally physically on campus. The issue is coming up now, not just for college universities, but maybe even more so for high schools and middle schools. What about a student who from home, over the internet, posts things on Facebook or other social media? When can the student be punished for that? What most of the courts have said is schools can punish such speech if it's disruptive of school activities. But what's enough to show that the speech is disruptive of school activities, especially when it goes on off campus? I think in generally the internet requires applying well-established traditional law to a new medium. But it does pose problems that haven't been seen before. The internet is wonderfully powerful as a tool for speech. It gives literally every person the ability to reach a mass audience, so long as the person has a smartphone or access to a modem, even in a public library. It used to be you had to be rich enough to own a newspaper, get a broadcast license to be able to do that. But democratizing access to a mass audience has cost. There are so many instances of people being subjected to harassment online. There's instances of private things, such as sexually explicit material, being put online without the individual's consent. And so much of this occurs on college campuses. I think traditional principles for harassment toward a public disclosure of private fact can be applied, but it's certainly a new context. Well, I've tried in my brief remarks to tell you what I see as the law surrounding free speech on campus. But I also think, as I conclude, it's important to remember that all of the answers here don't come from the law. Even though there's a First Amendment right to say something, doesn't mean that it should be said. That often the best response to the speech we don't like, as Oliver Holmes long ago said, is more speech. And I think that's particularly true on college campuses. So I think it's crucial that college administrators presidents and chancellors and deans remember that they have free speech rights too. When there's offensive incidents on campus, it's crucial that they speak out against them. I saw this very effectively early in my teaching career at the University of Southern California. Somebody wrote on a board in one of the classrooms a really ugly homophobic slur. Rather than try to figure out who wrote it and punish the individual, the then Dean Scott Weiss wrote a letter that he immediately had put in all of the students and faculty mailboxes. That shows you how long ago this was. <laughs> he described what occurred and he denounced it and he said that it was inconsistent with the community that we aspired to be. And he used this ugly incident as I think an important teaching moment. And colleges and universities need to be able to do that. But in the end, if what I've said makes you uncomfortable, I would leave you with thoughts that many have expressed to remember we don't need freedom of speech for the expression we like. We'd naturally let that go on anyway. What we need freedom of speech is for the speech that we detest. Often that's going to be racist, sexist, homophobic, anti-Semitic speech. And that's what's going on on campuses today. Thank you so much. And I promise I'll have the last time for questions. Glad to take your questions. Or you can disagree with me too, please. <laughs> Sir. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned trigger warnings, and I think we're all familiar with kind of the academic pushback on some of that. We know that like University of Chicago and several other universities have uh, kind of reaffirmed their commitment to allowing students to hear some of those upsetting texts or discussions. In light of what um, has been in the news cycle at Evergreen State College and uh, 
and some of that. And if you're not familiar, of course, I can. Okay. Um, do you see universities kind of having the pendulum swing back in the same manner that we see them talking about how trigger warnings aren't necessary on certain college campuses? Do you see universities in the First Amendment free speech realm uh, kind of pushing back, knowing that there are very real consequences for suppressing free speech? Just to take the two examples you mentioned, at the University of Chicago, the provost last year at the beginning of the school year issued a proclamation very strongly in favor of speech saying, we don't believe in safe spaces and trigger warnings here. A significant group of faculty, though clearly a minority, issued a statement disagreeing with the provost and saying that he wasn't sufficiently sensitive to the competing interests. The Evergreen State incident, and you can correct me if I've got it wrong, was there was a call to cancel classes out of respect for indigenous people and minority students. This particular professor refused to do so, um, and sub subjected to a great deal of vilification on campus as a result. Um, those are short versions of long stories, but the instance you referred to. The question that you ask is, what do I see on campuses today? Now, I have limited exposure. I mean, I've can talk about what I see on the campuses where I am or the campuses that I have the pleasure of visiting. But I also have the benefit of reading about what goes on in campuses. And I would say, as I began, that overall right now, support for free speech is waning. That I would say that if you put to a vote on the University of California Berkeley campus the question, should Milo Yiannopoulos and Ann Coulter be able to come speak next week? The majority of students would say no. The majority of faculty would say no. And I think the, what Berkeley reflects is something much more general. And that's evidenced by the opinion polls that you see, the ones that I mentioned and others. Other questions? Oh, there's a, I see, uh, please. I think, uh, yes, you're raising your hand? Yes? Yes? I saw you put your, I don't, I hope that's a question. I think the gentleman here in the fourth row raised his hand. Oh, that's why I wasn't sure. There's, there's a question here in the front row, and then a question about three rows back. Hi, um, thank Hi. you for speaking. Um, what about, um, hate speech that's made by dominant social groups whose like power has more power over um, like minorities that their their word doesn't have the same amount of power mm -hmm. as a dominant social group so sure. in most hate speech is that way that when you think of the speech of white supremacist groups that's exactly what they're doing and yet if you accept my premise that all ideas and views can be expressed on campuses period that includes hate speech by dominant white supremacists, white, white groups or majority groups. That the First Amendment doesn't draw a distinction based on the identity of the speaker or the identity of the audience. If you accept my premise that all ideas and views should be able to express on a college campus, period. Uh, good morning, Dean. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, what about the fighting words exception? Um, sure. Obviously these words, in my humble opinion, have very little social value and it's being directed at particular groups of people and it's actually inciting people to react violently. Is there any uh, connection sure. there with free speech? In 1942 in Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire, the Supreme Court said there are categories of unprotected speech. One of the categories it mentioned was fighting words. Chaplinsky now is 75 years old. Since Chaplinsky, the Supreme Court never again has upheld a fighting words conviction. There have been many fighting words cases that have gone to the Supreme Court. In virtually all of them, the Supreme Court has found that the law prohibiting fighting words is unconstitutional on vagueness and overbreath grounds. Now, the court at times has said, yes, there's this category, fighting words, that's unprotected by the First Amendment. The court did so in RV versus City of St. Paul in 1982. 
but there's not been a single fighting words conviction upheld by the court in 75 years. It leads me to believe that this really isn't a category of unprotected speech. And the reason these laws are so often declared unconstitutional, that they're unduly vague and overbroad, are why when hate speech codes have been based on fighting words, they too have been declared unconstitutional. Hi, Dean. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, Dean Chemerinsky. I want to say thank you so much for coming to our campus. Um, uh, you had mentioned the internet, and um, I think of the seminal case, Tinker versus Des Moines, and how that kind of set the precedent, and through the evolution, it's now more protective of kind of academic settings. Do you find with kind of the way that the new administration, how they communicate their ideas through social media flows, and how the White House Secretary Press has been um, I, I guess my general question is, how do you find that that can be further evolved and how, and, and, and its relationship to the First Amendment um, and how the president tweets out, how various anchors uh, correspond, et cetera? Sure. Let me take that in order. If you haven't studied First Amendment law, Tinker versus Des Moines Board of Education was a Supreme Court case in 1969. And it involved John and Mary Beth Tinker who wanted to wear black armbands to school to protest the Vietnam War. When they refused to do so, they were suspended from school. The Supreme Court, in a 7-2 decision, ruled in favor of John and Mary Beth Tinker. Just as Abe Fortas wrote for the court, and very eloquently said, students don't leave their free speech rights at the schoolhouse gate. That, of course, involved high schools. And the court there said, student speech can be punished only if it's actually disruptive of school activities. Interestingly, the subsequent Supreme Court cases, but speech in high schools, cases like Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer, um, Bethel School District versus Frazier, Mortz versus Frederick, all came down on the side of the school, not on the side of student speech. But none of them involved colleges and universities, which I think are quite different from a speech perspective. In terms of a president who does so much via Twitter, I think the interesting First Amendment issue there is, should we regard his Twitter account as the government's forum for speech. And the reason this matters is he's cut off from his Twitter feed some reporters who he believes aren't favorable to him. There's a lot of lower court cases that when it comes to, say, issuing press credentials, the government can't deny press credentials based on the view of the reporter. If President Trump's Twitter feed is a government forum for speech, then you can't exclude people on the basis of their ideology. Um, I think President Trump's Twitter feed is clearly a government forum for speech because he's expressing government policy, the government position on issues via that Twitter feed. But uh, the Knight Institute of Columbia University has filed a lawsuit against President Trump on this basis. Ms. Joseph Alfie, I'm the student chapter president of the American Constitution Society here at John Marshall. And uh, first, welcome, Dean Shemarinsky. Um, I echo the Dean's observation. Um, just a short time ago, uh, Professor Schwinn, who is our faculty advisor, held a forum on the Charlottesville incident. And I was uh, alarmed at how many law students supported an expansion on the limitations of free speech, especially when it came to hate speech. And I think that warrants further discussion and so please look out for uh, our chapter announcements of events coming up ahead. Uh, I think that we're going to definitely make some campus efforts to discuss these and other events. And I'll put a question mark at the end of it and say, that's great. Hi, I, uh, I wanted to thank you for coming today and thank, thank you for all the great, I had to say Barbary tapes, oh. you sound you sound the exact same as, uh, as the tapes. <laughs> so Funny thank how you. that happens. <laughs> I just wanted to say one. My Chicago accent. No, you, you sounds like a New York accent. I don't know why. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Okay, but <laughs> we discovered um, earlier we grew up four blocks apart. It's, so um, I just wanted to bring up an observation. I'm a little older here, but uh, my son's uh, uh, in high school, and last year um, it trickled down to freedom of speech. The school was taking a day off to bring in a group of speakers, and a small group of parents decided they wanted some different speakers, and it was a very uh, strong fight up in uh, it was up in Wilmet this past January. It got national exposure, and it was a small group of parents. And the more I thought about it, it was like the, the, the kids 
I actually thought maybe bring in these speakers. I think the kids are smart enough to know the difference and it opens up and it goes back to what you said. Freedom of speech is important and s the parents stopped it, but looking back, maybe they shouldn't have, and it's, but it's trickling down uh, maybe into the high schools as well. There's no doubt. Of course it is. <laughs> and I mean, we're at such a deeply polarized time in our society. It's not surprising that free speech is the focus point for a lot of the controversy, and it's not going to be contained in colleges, universities. I, I have a question. This is slightly re removed from the academic environment. People losing their jobs in the private sector because of participating in the events at Charlottesville or the person who worked for Google who did the post and then ending up losing right. his job. Are the same things motivating that trend? Or you think that's similar to what's motivating what you're seeing on campus? Well, and of course, you have to draw the distinction that I did at the outset between the government sector and the private sector. If it's the government sector, there's some protection of speech rights for government employees. Not a lot, but some. I mean, Garcetti versus Abalos in 2006 said there's no First Amendment protection of the speech of government employees on the job and the scope of their duties. But there's some speech protections generally. But in the private sector, private employers, like Google, aren't covered by the First Amendment at all. And generally, the tort law doctrines, like wrongful discharge, don't tend to provide very much protection for employees in the private sector. There's also a difference, and maybe this is the perfect place to conclude. I believe that colleges and universities exist for the exchange of ideas. That the only way knowledge can be advanced is through speech. But private companies generally don't exist for the advancement of knowledge and ideas. Private companies, apart from private universities, exist to make a profit, to benefit their shareholders. And so the whole equation of free speech is different. We could certainly have a discussion of, do we want to apply speech principles to private companies? The way we've applied anti-discrimination principles to private companies? But it's a different discussion. Thank you so much for having me.